resurrection last week, which is a Easter's all about that. And uh, take your Bible. We're going to do something different for the next couple of weeks, several weeks, more than a couple. Uh, turn to Ephesians chapter five, verses twenty-two to thirty-three, and you're probably going to recognize this as uh, what wives and husbands are supposed to do to one another how to act to one another. And we're going to talk about that a little bit, but Paul ends that section up by saying, and this is a picture of Christ and the church. So we're going to talk about the importance of the church. And I want you to take this and go out of here with it. I want you to just make a note and don't do anything with it. I want you to take this information that I want to give you and take it outside the doors of this church. People who come here on a regular basis people who have committed their lives to Christ, people who walk with Jesus every day, you don't have to tell them what to do. But many times in the church, we need to know exactly what to do. Let's read this passage. I think it will help us, or at least come alive for us. Am I still on? No. What did I do? <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to love their own wives as they love their own bodies. He who loved his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church because we are members of his body. For this reason, the man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our time. Father, we thank you for this day and for this passage. I pray, Lord, that you would help us as we work our way through it to see how this relates to Christ and the church. And we might see, first of all, the importance of the church. We ask for your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This is the week after Easter, and we want to take a detour, as I mentioned, and we're going to look at the importance of the church because this is what many people do. They drive by here or they drive by some church in the court in the course of an everyday life and they say, well, you know, that would be a neat thing to do if I just had time. Or I have heard this one more than one time. Well, preacher, I only get one day off a week. I work six days a week and I only get one day off. Okay, I understand that. But you know, we're really not here that long. Maybe today, but we're here, here. not here that long. That's okay. But the point that I want you to see is, folks, our society has lost the, the idea of the church as being important in society. Amen. It is not there. Amen. We can take it or leave it is the majority of people's ideas. But is that true? What happens when we walk through the doors on a Sunday morning? Are we here just to socialize with people who dress nice and seem to be nice? What makes our church different than the clubs that exist in our area? The Kiwanis Club, the Moose Club, the Masonic Lodge, the PTA, and you just go on and fill up. But they exist for a reason. Why does the church exist? Well, these are good questions. We're going to answer them. And I pray you leave this place with a better understanding of what a church is and what she stands for. The Apostle Paul in this text of Scripture shows us how marriage and the church are similar. They're very important. Now I want to tell you, if your marriage, if you consider your marriage not to be a good one, 
That does not take away from the church. And on the other hand, if your marriage is a good one, that doesn't necessarily mean your church is. But the point I'm making is a marriage that follows the Word of God is like a church that follows the Word of God. Amen. So let's consider this passage, and I believe it will answer a lot of questions for us because I'm not going to talk about marriage as much as I am the church. There's five, and I picked this word out of the preamble to our Constitution, not in our, our church, but in our country. There are five inalienable principles in this text that will help us see the importance of the church. You say, what's an inalienable principle? It's a principle that cannot be shot down. It is true no matter what. And that's the point that we want to see. There is pressure today on the church to conform to the ways of the world. And we have to keep what we have at this point. Let's go on. The first principle is in verses 22 to 24. This is very important for you to see, but it is simple. Christ is the head of the church, not Keith Jones. And no one else who ever stands behind this pulpit will be the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church. There are many parallels between true church and a godly marriage. Notice in your text, and I don't know what translation you're using. I'm using the New American Standard update of 1995. It says, wives be subject. The words be subject are in italics. They're not there. They're added. It's really what you call an ellipsis in the text. You bring the idea down from verse 21 where it says, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives to your own husband. That's the idea. That's how you understand that. Wives are to be subject to their own husbands as to the Lord. Jameson Fawcett Brown commentary says this. Submissiveness is rendered by the wife to the husband under the eye of Christ and so is rendered to Christ Himself. When a wife subjects herself to her husband, she is doing that to the Lord Himself. That's enough said about that. I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. The point is, as Paul continues on, he says, Jesus is the head of the church in the same way as a man is to be head of the home. Now let me stop there. If man, if you're not the head of your home, what's your problem? You don't have to answer me now. You can talk to me anytime. I'll give you my cell phone number. If you're not the head of your home, what is your problem? That does not mean that you lay the law down and everybody has to do what you say. What does it mean for a man to be the head of the home as Christ is the head of the church? Number one, we are to subject or submit ourselves to Christ in all things. In worship, in giving, and I'll challenge you here just briefly. God tells us in the book of Malachi, if you will test me, and I will show you that I will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, that there won't be room enough to receive it. Which part of that is hard to understand? If we will test him in the area of giving. In listening. I remember when I was in seminary, Dr. Ben Aubrey, the preaching professor at that time, and they hired another fellow that I never had for preaching classes. But Dr. Ben Aubrey was one of his, is younger than me, but this man is one of the finest preachers I've ever sat under, so he was well, well qualified to teach preachers how to preach. And I remember on a particular chapel, Dr. Aubrey was sitting on the front row, and the guy that was up there was as boring as anybody I've ever heard in my life. And I said to myself, I'm going to talk to Dr. Coppinger after this is over and tell him, really, you need to screen these guys. We got up to sing the hymn to dismiss, and I noticed Dr. Aubrey sitting on the front row, finishing up, writing down what the fellow had said. I did not go to Dr. Coppinger and get on to him for screening these guys. I felt like an idiot. Why? Why? Because 
Dr. Aubrey tro tried to drive into us, do all you can to connect with your audience. But if you're the audience, do all you can to connect with the person speaking. It's listening. It's very important. Our children need to be taught to listen. My dad and mom taught me to listen. And if I didn't, they reinforced that teaching in all kinds of ways. We did not know what time out was unless we were watching a soccer match. I've never put a child in time out. And I won't do that. I don't think they understand that. Time out doesn't hurt. And folks, if you put your hand in the fire, it's going to hurt. I need to know that. In prayer, when we pray, do you pray along with the person praying? We should be in attendance. Oh, I can park here for a while. You say, well, preacher, you've got to be here every Sunday. No, I don't. I don't have to be here. But I choose to be here. Because you see, Sheila makes out my paycheck every two weeks. And I take that and I go down to the bank and I put it in the bank just like you do your paycheck or your retirement or whatever you get. And the church does not pay me to do this. They pay me so I can do this and not work somewhere else. Amen. Because the point is, if I've got to work another job, and I have done it. It's a job, though, to work a, church, a job and pastor a church. But folks, do you want your children to be in heaven with you one day? Do you want your grandchildren to be in heaven with you one day? Then why do we make church a well, I'll go if I feel like it kind of thing? Debbie has put on the bulletin board out there, your children are our priority. Why? Do we just want to teach them Bible stories? No. We're teaching them what the Scripture says about how to get to heaven. And Roberta, i got to say, Pilgrim's Progress is one of my favorite books in the world. You see, if we don't submit to the head of the church, what happens? We sin. And God is not pleased. You say, so you're telling me that church attendance is necessary? I guarantee you it is. I don't know how you live your Christian life, but I know how I live mine. By Tuesday, I'm sorry, wait a minute, let's back up. By Monday sometime, I need some reinforcement. I don't know, maybe you're spiritual enough, you don't need that. Come Wednesday night, I need to get with the people of God. Come Sunday morning, I can't wait to get here. I like it so much, I'd walk down here. I'd run if I had to. So if we don't submit to the head of the church... We sin. God is not pleased. Let's go on. Number two. These are pretty simple. They come right out of the text. Number one, Christ at the head of the church. Number two, Christ loves His church. Look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wife just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself up for her. Husbands are to love their wives. It's interesting to me, and I have considered this over years of studying the Bible, that wives are never told to love their husbands. You know why? Because they just do. They just do. But Paul has to tell men, love your wives. And they say, well, how am I supposed to do that, Paul? You do that like Christ loves the church. And Paul uses the imperative here, the mood of command. And you know that <laughs> word love is a popular word, and we know it from the Greek language, agape. This is a self-sacrificing love. This is a love where you give yourself up for the other person. And I'll say this, it had nothing to do with this, but I came to my mind and I think the Lord put it there. When Debbie and I had children, guess who became the center of our lives? Those children did. And that doesn't mean that we did whatever they want. That means they went with us wherever we went. That means that we took care of them. That means sometime when I wanted to go fishing, I couldn't because those children needed me. If they went to the hospital, both of us went. Everything in our lives was centered around those children because we poured our lives into them to show them that there is a God in heaven that cares about them. But if they don't want to listen, 
they will perish, the scripture says. Amen. Husbands are to love their wives with a self-sacrificing lifestyle. And I'm not bragging on myself, but I've learned this the hard way, folks. There's been times in my marriage that I've had to say no to something because I said yes to her. If you don't know me very well, I love to fish. I probably had, had my boat in the water three times this year. But I love to do that. But if something comes up in this church, if someone's in the hospital, the boat's going to stay there. And if my wife says, Honey, I need you to go to a certain place with me, whatever I've got planned is just going to have to wait. That's self-sacrificing. The amazing thing, though, last night some of the ladies went off with their daughters and Debbie was uh, able to go with them. And she told me when she left, she said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to miss you till you get back. <laughs> she said, well, you can watch one of those kung fu movies or whatever that you like. Well, I couldn't find one of those, so I wanted something else. But the, the amazing thing is I didn't go off and do my thing and she went off and did her thing. You can ask her. In our whole marriage, we have always done most everything together. There's two things she doesn't do with me. Hunt or fish. And that's okay. Because if we got in a deer stand together, she would want to talk. You know that? And if you talk to me, babe, I would talk right back. But notice what this verse says. Husband, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Oh, by the way, ladies, I'm going to tell you, men, just turn your hearing off for a minute. In verse 22, wives be subject to your own husbands. The word own there, O-W-N, is the Greek word idios. It means your own particular, that's what it means, but I thought often, you know, why be subject to your idiot husband as to the Lord? I said, yes, some women have told me that's the kind of husband they have. Thank God my wife didn't marry one like that. But back in verse 25, Jesus gave himself for the church. We owe him a debt that we cannot ever repay. Amen. The, the, the death of Christ on the cross the life of Christ, 33, 33 and a half years, however long it was, we cannot pay Him back for that. It is not possible. We owe Him. We are in His debt until the day we close our eyes on this planet. He did what He did out of love. No one made Jesus do this. We got this idea that Jesus and God are talking, God the Father, and God tells Jesus, now you need to go down to earth and you need to die for those people and you need to do this and you need to do that. It wasn't like that. It wasn't like that at all. God did not make His Son do that. Jesus willingly did that to bring us to God. He died for His church out of love. And the church, let me say this because we probably got confused about this. The church is the body of Christ scattered all over the world. This is just a local church. There are other churches with, with followers of Christ in them in other places. But what I'm telling you here, Jesus died, out of, died for His church out of love. And I have to ask myself when I look at this passage, do I do what I do for my wife out of love or because I think I'm supposed to do that? So you might say the church is the entity for which Christ died. You say, well, did he die for this local church? For all the believers and followers of Christ in this local church? Yes, he did. So if we have little or no use for the church, we have little or no use for that for which he died. It's like you whether you're a man or a woman, going to someone that you know's home and them completely ignoring you and talking to your spouse. 
you get in the car to go home, you say, well, why wouldn't they talk to me? Don't they care anything about me? They talk to you, but they never talk to me. You will, let me tell you this, folks. I know this because I have been there and done it. You will never grow in your Christian life apart from a local church. Amen. I can't tell you how many people tell me, and this is constant, oh, preacher, I'm right with God, but they never darken the doors of the church anywhere. Does that mean they're going to hell? That's between God and them. But I can tell you this, that person probably doesn't pick their Bible up. They probably don't pray. And how in the world can they worship apart from a local church? Let's go on. Number three. Verses 26 and 27. Something else Jesus does. Christ sanctifies His church. Notice what it says. So that Jesus died for His church, gave Himself up for her, so that, that's a purpose clause, that He might sanctify her. You say, what in the world does that mean? To be set apart for sacred use. The word sanctify is the verb form of the word holy. Same idea. To make holy. Jesus sets His part, His church apart for sacred use. We are the church. This building is not the church. If something happened to this building this week and it's leveled, the church of, at O'Brien is still alive. Amen. It's not this building. We make up the church. And Jesus is at work through His Holy Spirit making us holy. You say, well, what if we fight against Him? He fights back. And He wins. He's got ways of making you do things that you don't want to do until you see that you should do them. Didn't your parents do the same thing? My parents said, <laughs> Dad, I want a dirt bike. Son, you're not getting a dirt bike. Well, why? Well, you know the first thing that comes to your mind. Because I said so. <laughs> no, son, if you want a dirt bike, go get a job. And by the time you get a job, you realize you can't ride that thing back and forth to work and you'll buy a car or a truck instead. Jesus is at work through His Holy Spirit making us holy. Look at this passage of Scripture. I put it up on the screen. This is from the English Majority Text Version of the Bible. You say, well, I've never heard of that. That's okay. It's still a good translation. My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. Paul is talking to the church at Galatia. And this is what he said. I am in labor again for you. Ladies, would you like to do that again for the children you had? That's Paul's point. But notice what he says at the end. Until Christ is formed in you. That's not an active idea. That is a passive idea. So what is Paul saying? Who forms Christ in you? The Holy Spirit of God. Not Christ Himself. He's given that job over to the Holy Spirit. And notice what else he says. Now this might be difficult for you to understand because I went through several translations to try to find the one that said it the best. And well, they just, I've got one and I'll share it with you in just a moment. So that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. That is very confusing. Why is it very confusing? He has cleansed us with water through the word. I don't mean baptism water. I'm going, we're going to have baptism next Sunday, the Lord willing, and we're going to baptize David and Dawn. And I'm so excited about that. But let me tell you, when we let that water out after it's all over with, there's no sin in that water. <laughs> baptism doesn't wash sin away. The blood of Christ does that. And a person comes to me and says, well, I'd like to be baptized we got a lot of talking to do before we actually do that. This is what Ephesians 5.26 says in the Tree of Life version. You say, what is that? It's a Jewish translation of the New Testament. To make her holy, having cleansed her by immersion in the Word. 
How are you how are you and I cleansed today, folks? By the word of God. Not by going through the waters of baptism. Because if that cleans us, we're going to have to have baptism every Sunday, morning and Sunday. And we forget eating, it's not going to happen. We're going to be busy baptizing. We'll never have time to eat. I know some of you saying that probably would be a bad thing. But you see, the Word of God has this cleansing effect. If you're familiar with the tabernacle, the very first thing, once you passed the brazen altar, you came up to this bronze polished wash basin called a laver. What, is, what happened there? The priest would wash his hands and his feet there before he went into the tabernacle. And that is a picture of the Word of God. Now we're not told the size of that for a reason. Why the Word of God is not limited. You can read it today and be cleaned and read it tomorrow and be cleaned. It will keep doing it. It's better than Dawn dish soap. <laughs> The Word of God continues to cleanse us. It has no limit. John said this in 1 John 1, 7, but if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. But you ask me, Brother Keith, why does Jesus cleanse His church? Notice what the text says. That He might present to Himself the church in all her glory. As a bride is presented to her husband. Have you ever been to a wedding where the bride wore white and it was not spotless? I've done quite a few. And it didn't matter if the bride was 88 years old or 18 years old. Usually the white that she wore was as pure as she could find because that is exactly what it's talking about. And when Paul says this, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory. What's the glory of the church? Her head. Her head. You say, well, wouldn't the head of a her be a her instead of a him? Jesus is the head of the church. Never forget that. With no blemish or spot or wrinkle, but with holiness and blamelessness. And that means in all her glory and splendor. Now, I want you to think about this. Looking at the state of the church in America, do you think that she is blameless and holy? You see, that's the problem, isn't it? Yeah. We look at the outside. God looks at the inside. <clears throat> but let's go on. Number four. Christ nourishes and cherishes His church. Verses 28 to 30. As a husband ought to do his wife. You say, what's nourish and cherish actually mean? Well, Jesus feeds His church. That's what's happening right now. That's what's happening right now. You are getting the Word of God. That feeds your soul. You ought to be leaving here having to cover your mouth so that you don't burp. You should be full when you leave here. And that's my job. And I take it pretty serious. You say, well, how does Jesus nourish or feed His church? Through the preaching of the Word. So if you don't come, guess what happens? Have you ever gone without eating for one day? I have. I did it on purpose. I wanted to see if I could do it. And I did. But boy, after the sun went down, I tore something up. And the thing is, Sunday to Sunday, yes, we have a Wednesday night program. You can get fed at the Wednesday night program too, you know. But from Sunday to can you imagine going six days or seven days without anything to eat? But there are a lot of people that say, well, you know, I don't think I want to go to church today. So I'm starving myself. So if you decide not to attend, you're starving yourself spiritually. You say, well, Brother Keith, there's reason sometimes for people to miss church. Yes, there are. When you're in the hospital, you can miss church. You say, well, 
Look at all the things going on out in the world. Folks, when we get to heaven, none of that's going to be important. It ought not to be now. I'm afraid when we get to heaven, if there is a scorecard up there or a scoreboard, it's going to have literally none. And the church, I don't know how many Christians. Because what have they started doing? They started having Little League games on Wednesday night and Sunday morning. I had a professor in seminary. And he's still alive. He's a little bit older than I am. Dr. Don Whitney. When he was young, he loved baseball and he was pretty good at it. He played, but he told us in class, he said, guys, when we had a playoff game, it was on a Sunday morning. Guess what my parents did? They took me to the ballpark and dropped me off and went to church. That's how important it is. You say, well, I just couldn't do that. No, you can't. What are you teaching your kids when you do that? Amen. Because if you, and I don't know how to say this other than just saying it, Whatever you allow in moderation, your children are going to excuse in excess. Yes. So if you say, well, I'll go to church every once in a while, your children aren't going to go at all. Because it wasn't really that important to you. Secondly, Jesus cares for His church. He nourishes, He cares for, He provides vision. He provides the means. We have a leadership team meeting today. And I love to go to those meetings. That's about the only meeting in my life I like to go to. Why do you say that? Because we are laying out a vision for our church. And He provides the means. So to love the church of Jesus Christ according to what Paul says right here, is to love ourselves because we are the church. The members of His body. He says it right here. To love the body is to love ourselves. So do you act towards the church like you do yourself? Or do you ignore the body and act like you're not a part of it? I'm not asking you to come down here and mow the yard. <laughs> If you want to, we won't turn you away. <laughs> but there's so much to be done here. On Wednesday night, how many children did we have Wednesday night? 30 something children. Folks, most of those come from homes where there's no, where there's only one parent. And some of those come from a home where there is no parent. It's a guardian. And if you think they're getting everything they need to get from public school, you and I need to sit down and have a serious discussion. I could not believe, and this was verified to me in more than one way. You know how Brantford Elementary is going to uh, stop an active shooter? They got boxes of rocks by the door. The kids are supposed to pick up rocks and throw at the guy with a gun. Richard, what happens when you take a knife to a gun <clears throat> What a world we live in. <laughs> I can honestly tell you, folks, if my children were little, we would be homeschooled. Why? One, number one, because I can keep them safe at my house. I don't know what will happen in a public school. Number five, and we'll be done. I know you're probably ready to get out of here. Christ makes His church one with Himself. In verses 21 or 31 to 33, Christ makes His church one with Himself. You see, being in the church makes us one with Christ in the same way as being married to a woman or a man makes us one with them. We're His body on this earth. And since we're His body, we must not act like we are not His body. Can you imagine if your feet got a mind of themselves. Yeah. I know I made the joke when I drive my truck by Harbor Freight, the steering wheel <laughs> won't turn and go in. But you know that's not true. And when I go by Bass Pro, I want to pull off at the exit there. But it's not the truck, it's me. 
if your feet got a mind of themselves or your hands, what if my hands started doing whatever they wanted rather than what I wanted? And I've seen people who were handicapped in some way. That's exactly what had happened to them. They could not make their body do what their mind told it to do. That's one of the bad things about Parkinson's disease. You get to the point where you tell your body to do it and it won't do it. Or your eyes. I kind of agree with Job. When Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes, therefore I will not look upon the maid. What is he saying? They were accusing Job of, of being unfaithful to his wife while all that calamity came upon him. And Job says, no, no, no. I made a covenant with my eyes. I don't look at an unmarried woman. And guys, I would encourage you, if you do, or look at another woman, where should you look? Here. Up. I don't care what they got on to make you look somewhere else. Teach our children and grandchildren that. I know society is messing up every go to a clothing store and look at some of the clothes they have for young girls. You say, well, what about guys? Blue jean t-shirts fine with me, folks. Yeah. Not the church, but we are the body of Christ on this earth. We must not <laughs> act like we are not. And that is just part one of the importance of the church. We're going to talk next week about the importance of attendance. We're going to get into that because it's very important that you realize when you come and make it a practice, not only are you imitating the Lord Jesus Christ, but you are teaching your children this is important. Let me ask you, do you act like you're the body? Do all of your friends know you're a follower of Christ? Because you see, in 2018, we don't need any more closet Christians. That's right. We need men and women, boys and girls, who will stand up for the truth of God and be counted. You remember Isaiah was in the temple when God called him. What was his response? Here am I. Send me. When Abraham sent Eleazar to find a wife for Isaac. Oh, I love this story. It's in the 24th chapter of Genesis. Oh, I wish I could have been there for that. <laughs> but anyway, Eleazar goes to a well and he's got a bunch of camels because he's bringing gifts for this girl that he's never met and he prays this. This is what he prays. Oh, God of my father Abraham. And then he asks God, I want you to send the right girl and I'll know it's the right girl because she'll say, let me water your camels. <laughs> Rebecca comes. She offers him water and then offers to water his camel. And so Eleazar knows right away this is probably the girl. So they go back to her father's house. She's got a bunch of brothers, so you better be careful when you go into the household Amen. to get one girl, and she's got a bunch of brothers. He stays overnight. He gets ready to go the next day, and they say, Whoa, whoa, we want you to stay a while. I've got to get back to my master. And this girl says she will go with me. And they say, Well, let's ask her ourselves. So they bring Rebecca in front of them and they say, well, you go with this man. And she said, I will go. <coughs> Men and women have responded to the call of God for centuries. You can respond to the call of God today. You see the Holy Spirit come and He knocks on your heart's door and He says, hey, you need Jesus Christ. You are in danger of losing everything. But if you come to Christ, you get it all. Am I preaching health, wealth, and prosperity? In a way, I am. Because folks, I remember when I came to Christ, I thought for years I'd have to give up a lot to do that. And when I finally gave up and walked with him a while, I turned around and realized those were crumbs that I was so helped up about. 
when eating at the master's table, you don't have just crumbs. Will you go with Jesus and be a part of his church? I can tell you this. The benefits are out of this world. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the time you've given us together.